can 99% share with you uh, a little bit about who I am, but I'm going to tell you, just like I tell my students, and I'm really grateful that my signature course, uh, that so many of my signature course students are here tonight, so thank you for being here, because they have heard versions of this lecture. Uh, there will be pieces in this uh, discussion that they have not seen. Um, but uh, I have shared with them that I speak from a grade of experience. I speak from personal experience. <laughs> this crazy looking woman is my mother. That's me on day one. And my mom uh, got clean and sober from alcohol and drugs when I was 10 years old in 1975. And now I've just given away my age. But that I did not mean to do. That's all right. My mom managed from the first moment that she figured out that she was alcoholic and got help. She stayed in recovery for her entire life, and she passed away five years ago with 40 years in recovery. So I am dedicating this to my mom. This, she was the inspiration for my curiosity about alcoholism and drug abuse, for my knowledge that kept me from having to run into train wrecks, and for inspiring the work that I do as well. All right. How many of you have heard all about the Just Say No campaign? Unfortunately, it was even reiterated and re-resurrected by our recent administration. Just don't drink. Just don't use drugs. Have a good night. No, that's, I, that's not my point. No, I'm not going to end it there. How many of you had dare when you were... How many of you see this? This is your brain on drugs, right? You remember this is your brain on drugs? How about drugs are bad, okay? <laughs> right? So the message is, don't use drugs. If you're smart, don't use drugs. <clears throat> that message was the primary mechanism of understanding substance misuse and how to get around it for many years into the 80s, even the early 90s, there were some who were still saying. <coughs> Research-based perceptions, however, have changed this view. So what we know about addiction now is that it is a brain disease. I put up a book by my colleague, uh, Professor Emeritus Carlton Erickson from pharmacy. How many of you are from pharmacy? Shout out to pharmacy. Oh, not too many pharmacists. There you go. Um, Carlson's book is nationally renowned for having the most extensive information and education about addiction as a brain disease. And if you Google Carlton Erickson pharmacy and drug myths, he's got the longest list I've ever seen of drug myths online. I do recommend it. But we do know that the brain chemistry is what addiction is about. And so telling somebody don't use drugs is about as effective as parents chaining their kids to the bed. It doesn't work. So I'm going to show you just a real quick introductory video about addiction as a brain disease, and then tell you a little bit more about what we know and what I do. What are your fiercest cravings? Whether we're ducking out for a smoke, going for glory at the blackjack table, or drowning our sorrows in a glass of wine, we all have ways that we seek to push our pleasure buttons. What happens when this need for pleasure becomes a full-time pursuit? When our fix turns into something more like a dependence? Used to be that addiction was considered a sort of moral failing. But now, with a much better understanding of how the human brain works, scientists are learning new clues about the vicious cycle of desire, binging, and withdrawal that traps tens of millions of people. Our brains evolved the reward system based on a chemical called dopamine. This amazing neurotransmitter creates cravings in us to encourage behaviors that help us survive, such as eating, procreating, or interacting socially. In turn, pleasure is then stimulated by other neurotransmitters in hedonic hotspots of the brain. When dopamine's craving circuitry overwhelms the pleasure hotspots, addiction occurs. Essentially, your reward system is hijacked. Let's 
break it down this way. Your desires are triggered when dopamine, starting at the top of the brainstem, travels through neural pathways to affect the brain. Drugs increase this flow of dopamine. Where does the dopamine go? It flows throughout the brain's craving circuit, including the dorsal striatum, where brain nerve cells called neurons begin to form habits by IDing the fun things that you've done, like buying drugs or cigarettes. Dopamine also goes to the prefrontal cortex, or with the help of an amino acid called glutamate, rich visualizations that cue cravings are conjured. Think images of drug paraphernalia, sex, or a bottle of booze. Then there's the amygdala, where the dopamine causes neurons here to be stimulated by learned emotional responses, like rich, pleasure-coded memories. So what happens when drugs artificially flood these pathways with dopamine? For one thing, the rush can rewire your brain to want more drugs, and thus create addiction. But it turns out different drugs interact with the reward system in unique and interesting ways. Cocaine, for example, blocks dopamine transporters and prevents the removal of excess dopamine from synapses. Methamphetamine, on the other hand, floods the terminals of neurons, displacing dopamine into synapses instead. And heroin blocks dopamine inhibitors, causing synapses to flood with dopamine without restraint. The good news? With a refined understanding of the devastating effects of these drugs comes new angles and approaches to the treatment of addiction that have shown remarkable promise. Cocaine addicts have been able to shut off their cravings abruptly when electromagnetic pulses are applied to their prefrontal cortex. A drug hitherto used to treat muscle spasms, called baclofen, has shown promise for treating alcohol dependence. As more and more of our friends and family are affected by crippling addiction, it's comforting to know that we are finally finding effective ways to take our brains back. So, if addiction is a brain disease, and someone that starts using at a very young age is at high risk for this brain disease, then what can we do to treat them? Well, what have we, what have we typically done? When you, have you met a young person that had an addiction? Where were they sent? Rehab, right? How long is rehab? 28 days, right? That's what everybody has been conditioned to understand and believe. So, parents for years have been, when they discover that their kid has an issue with substance use disorder, they send them off to treatment with an expectation that they're going to get enough information and that they're going to be able to learn some coping skills and then they're going to be able to come home and be abstinent and go back to their lives. Yep? Here's the problem with that. What we know to be true is Remember that video we just saw? That the brain gets triggered by all kinds of stimulus in an environment. Kids that the other kids are accustomed to using with. Other, other environments, settings where they use, places where they use. And the availability makes it very, very hard to resist the temptation. Especially because one of the things that we know that's very interesting is that even that, that someone with a disrupted pleasure pathway, which is how Carlton refers to it, I'm not going to make you do that funny head thing that my class had to do when he came and spoke to us, but people with disrupted pleasure pathways, that once they are exposed to triggers, their brain actually starts to produce small amounts of the, the response drug the feel-good chemical like dopamine prior to even picking up the substance. So they're already in a relapse even before they put it into their body. Does that make sense? Hitting rock bottom. That's another myth about treatment that has lingered through the years. We used to believe that you had to absolutely be at your very, very worst and lose everything possible in order to get into recovery. But we still talk, I, I can't stand that there's a bar called Rock Dog that drives me crazy. But everybody thinks that you have to lose it all in order to get well. And the truth is 
that nowadays we have a totally different way of categorizing whether or not somebody can get into recovery by virtue of a whole new model called the stage of change, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. The other myth that comes from conventional treatment is that abstinence is the best medicine, that it is the only way to stop using, is that, and typically through 12-step programs, right? You go, you get sober, you get well, you never use again for the rest of your life. Nowadays, we understand that not everybody that has a problem with substances has a disrupted pleasure pathway or it has a substance use disorder. Some people are using with problem behaviors. And so they're able to stop in different ways. For example, um, Matt Olson over at our mental health center runs a group called uh, Motivating to Moderate. And so students get together and they talk about how if they're using more than they like to, they contract with him and they support each other in maintaining their contracts to cut back. Does that make sense? The other thing that we know to be true today in the midst of this opioid epidemic is that harm, harm reduction mechanisms are really, really very successful for some people. So if someone is already with a full-blown substance use disorder, and they're not ready to give up all substances, perhaps they'd be willing to give up the most harmful, the ones that are resulting in the greatest risk. So, remember how we talked about 28 days? 28 days of treatment is a lot of information to take in, but it doesn't really provide an individual with enough to carry them through their environments, their return home, all of the triggers in their community. So one of the models that was created by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is called ROPS. That's Recovery Oriented Systems of Care. And what they are is networks of agencies, services, supports that can essentially wrap around a young person when they're returning from treatment. So we know that if agencies are working together, that is the best possible uh, scenario for youth and recovery. We utilize now a socio-ecological model, knowing that individual work is going to probably be necessary, but we're going to have to make some inroads with their peer groups, with their family and their friends, with their extended family and their social networks. We have to look at organizations and how, how the system of recovery is working. We look to the community and the neighborhood. So we try to bring together coalitions. And the society and public policy piece is really critical as well. And I'm going to be honest, I was raised as a clinician. So I was trained to do clinical work. And I thought, I'll leave the policy to my colleague Diana Donito, who is an expert in policy. But when it came down to it, when I was advocating for youth and we had our uh, opioid outbreak here in Austin, we needed to change the laws so that we could make naloxone available, which is an antidote to overdose, heroin overdose, and opioid overdose. So I actually brought a group of students over to the Capitol. They testify, I testify, and it's one of the only bills that has gone through the Texas uh, legislature in a unanimous fashion in a lot of years. So we were very proud of that. Um, so you don't have to be a policy expert to lean into policy. Your own stories, your own experiences can be the most relevant piece. Expert is another system that is fairly recent, the last decade to two decades or so. And it stands for screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment. So what we know, again, is that in order to provide somebody adequate care, you can't just send them to treatment and then send them back to their community. You need to do a full screening to make sure that you're reaching people at different um, levels of readiness for change. You do brief interventions and a referral to treatment, the most relevant treatment for that individual in a client-centered way. And then we do follow-up. And the follow-up can look like a lot of different things. We're going to talk a lot about that as this goes on. And as I've mentioned, 
we had to couple the abstinence-based models with the harm reduction models because not everybody wants to uh, can come in ready to give up all of their substances that, that many people don't even believe it's necessary and it might not be for them. Uh, not everybody that uses drugs is addicted to drugs. But there are percentages of people who are. Um, but it's important to know that reducing harm is a big picture, a big part of this picture. So conventional prevention, I think you raised your hand earlier, but how many of you had the D.A.R.E. program in your high school? Okay, how many, did the police do the D.A.R.E. program or counselors? Police. Police. So that was primarily policemen coming into your schools and educating you, providing information. Yes? Back in my day, they don't think they do this anymore, they actually passed around a bottle, bag of pot so we would know not, what not to use. And then they put a big poster up on the wall with all these multicolored pills and all these different shapes that looked like a candy store and said, don't use those. Right? So information only is not an effective mechanism of prevention. The DARE program has evolved to include other factors from evidence-based models, uh, but in and of itself, it's not enough. How many of you had shattered dreams at your high school? Okay. Shattered dreams is a very dramatic prevention program where they model a, uh, a DUI. They have a mock death with lots of fake blood and traumatized students. Uh, if it's done well, you have students crying because they're essentially told that they're losing a friend. And so we model that experience. Do you know what percentage of students change their drinking and drugging behaviors because of shattered dreams? Five. Zero. <laughs> The only kids that it might impact are kids who have already decided not to drink or use substances, and it may reinforce that. But we know that this is not an evidence-based program. If anything, I always argue that they need to have counselors on board because so many students get traumatized by the experience. The only time that this has potential to work is if it's in a community that has actually lost kids to a DUI accident. But would you want to replicate this and, and recreate uh, a, a false um, recreation of the death of a student? That would be unethical, right? So we know that that is not an effective program. How about drug and alcohol and tobacco contracts? Anybody in band and have to sign a no drinking contract? Or PAL and sign a, right? What else did you have to sign? Sports. You have to sign a no drinking contract. Right? And we know that from interviews and qualitative research that they're not very effective. That they're on they're on file somewhere so that so that schools can say we're zero, zero tolerance policies and students work around them. Not an evidence-based practice. What are the evidence-based practices? First of all, rather than just say no, we recognize that we need to teach students drug resistance strategies in order to be able to say no, because drug offers are not coming from strangers standing on street corners. Who are they coming from? Drug offers. Friends, who else? Family, yes. Sometimes older brothers and sisters, cool best friends. It's, it's not somebody that you don't know. The just say no, refuse, works for some people, and particularly in elementary schools, we teach kids to just hold their hand up and say, not interested. That's great. But if you have an intimate relationship with someone, you'll probably have to use something more sophisticated. So we teach students to learn to explain why they're not going to use. And we and everybody has a different explanation. Some would say, I get grounded. Some would say, I lose my car. Some would say, I, I, th I like to tell the story of my son. I read, a, I read a, a research article that hasn't been widely replicated, but I read a study that you could do a token economy with you and pay them not to drink a drug, to delay the onset of use, okay? So when he was 13, I came up with an amount that I thought sounded like a lot of money to a 13-year-old. I think it was a lot of money to a 13-year-old. I said, if you make it to your 17th birthday without a drink or a drug, 
I would give you $1,000. That's a lot of money, right? I always joke that the reason that I was willing to go up that high is I know the cost of rehab. It's a bargain. But the bottom line is, he had made the decision not to drink or drug, but it gave me as a parent an excuse to breathalyze him and do drug testing, which my class laughed out loud when I told them I did, breath, I did uh, drug test him after we went to a Mac Miller concert, <laughs> where the songs start with, ah, that's a lyric, right? Right? That's a lyric. So I drug tested him, came up normal, and I asked him when he was 17, as I was handing him a check for $1,000, I said, did this help you? make your decision not to drink or drug. And he said, actually, I had already made that decision for myself. I probably wouldn't have done it anyway. But I'm going to tell you that every time someone offered me a drug, it was helpful to be able to say, I lose $1,000 if I take that from you. So it gave him a really good explanation for why he wasn't using it. One of the things we know about social norming, even on college campuses, is if, they, if we ask you, how many people do you think are using on a college campus? You always overestimate how much drinking is going on on campus. It really is a lot less than you think it is. So in terms of social norm campaigns, that's evidence-based practice, we tell students it's okay not to drink. That is not the majority of the kids. That is not the majority of what's going on. So it's very important to be able to look at the evidence, that the research, look at what the research has. Avoid simply means don't go into situations where you're going to be tempted to use. And most students know which parties are going to have substances that they're going to make them uncomfortable and which ones are not. And again, that can be a harm reduction intervention if you're comfortable with alcohol, but you're not comfortable with cocaine or bowls and pills or whatever you might anticipate is at a certain party. And then leave simply means that when something gets broken out that you're uncomfortable with, that you take a phone call and say, I gotta go, with or without an excuse. Uh, I had one kid at Garza, at Garza um, High School that liked to tell people that he had irritable bowels and nobody would want him to stay when he would announce that. Be creative. Information is a piece in evidence-based prevention. Social skill building of how to have good, solid, intimate relationships with other people. And along that, with that goes problem solving and communication. These are the skills that are in all evidence-based prevention programs. Resistance strategies. It's not enough just to teach life skills training without specific drug resistance strategies. This comes from a program called Keeping It Real that I helped develop with my mentor at Arizona State University. It's an evidence-based practice. There are a lot of good ones. My favorite thing about this Drug Resistance Strategies project is it is culturally grounded. So my early research, uh, when I first came to UT, the grant that I got from the National Institute on Health, was to look at ways of having young people culturally adapt drug prevention programs for their community and their population. But I wasn't talking just about schools. I did students adapting programs in alternative schools, but also incarcerated youth, LGBTQ, IAA youth. We did it with kids that were on the border. We did it with kids that were in low-income housing programs, after-school programs. Uh, we did it with Kids that were, um, one other population, I always forget this one. It'll come back to me. But you get the point, right? At risk populations, adapting it for their own folks. So, for example, one of the communication skills is I statements. You say, I feel blank when you or when I, right? So you're conveying your own feelings, not saying you should or you shouldn't, but how I feel. So, we asked the kids, well, it, the original curriculum said, I feel blank when I go to the school dance. Well, of course, the kids in the low-income housing programs that were hanging out at the Boys and the Girls Club said, we don't go to school dances, they're stupid. Like, so I said, what do you want it to say? 
And they said, I wanted to say, and they thought they were kidding, but we put it in print, I feel blank in the club with a bottle full of bug, which is a quarter of a portion line from 50 cents. So we put that in there, and what happens when you use their own references in the student work? Take a guess. They know that it's written for them, that it applies to them, and that it's theirs. And so it increases retention, it increases effectiveness. We know that the tailored programs have a stronger impact, mild to moderate effects, but a stronger impact on drug and alcohol use after they receive the curriculum. So let's talk about research-based interventions. Some of this is repetitive, but I, I want to I wanna reiterate, and then we're going to move on to the, all the creative projects that are happening. Stage of readiness for change rather than waiting for hitting bottom. So the stage of readiness for change basically says that you may encounter, and we talked about it today in our class, you might encounter someone like a roommate or a friend who drinks or uses substances more than you're comfortable with. And it's almost always a friend or a family member that knows it's a problem for someone before they do. So we're encouraging people to have those conversations. Well, my students will become, as by virtue of having the class, drug and alcohol peer advisors. So they're going to learn more and more about these kind of conversations. Uh, if any of you are interested in that, you can see me afterwards because we're going to have other workshops and trainings to get Dallas on the board. So we've got this stage of readiness for change that says, even if somebody says, that's not my problem, there are things that you can do that are effective interventions, such as saying, well, that's great, because if it was a problem for you, you'd probably be doing this, and this, and this. And once you name those things, then they're saying inside, what are they seeing inside their head? The checklist, right? They're saying, oh, I actually do do that. Or, oh, yeah, I do have blackheads whenever I drink. Or, oh, yeah, no, I definitely have drink, I'm drinking more than I used to drink. Yeah, I definitely lose time the night before. Yeah, I definitely see some changes in my personality. All of the things that they might see start to have power for them. And if they're in a later state of readiness, you can actually hook them up with resources. You're going to learn about some of those resources today. We know that we have been treating a chronic illness with acute care for way too long. So 28 days of treatment is acute care. It says, you're in crisis, we're going to catch you up, we'll take you away to treatment, and then you should be made better. What we know to be true is that chronic illnesses need to be treated and supported over time. So we like to think about it more like diabetes or cancer, where you get to be in remission, you get to choose healthier behaviors, and you get to maintain that over a period of time if you're utilizing effective coping mechanisms and support. Oops, we flying Left right. Building ecosystems rather than silos. So this is where I start to lay the groundwork for telling you about some of the most exciting things that I get to be involved in nowadays. We know that for years and years and years, rehabs have worked separately, intensive outpatient programs have worked separately, agencies that have peer recovery coaches, 12-step programs, universities, research programs, we were all working in our own discipline. We had hospitals doing their own work on substance use disorders with youth. We had all of the parents having organizations. We had the prevention folks in their corner of the world talking about these issues. And we had not had the conversations together. So we talk now about breaking down silos. We try to create essentially wraparound care rather than just rehab. Client-centered care rather than prescribed lectures and series offered at rehabs, and research collaborations and community partnerships. And as Dean Iverson so graciously mentioned, uh, recovery schools. There are two versions of recovery schools. There are collegiate recovery programs, CRPs, and there are high school recovery programs. Recovery high schools are a newer phenomenon one of the largest in the country is Archway Academy in Houston. Has close to 100 kids that attend. Uh, and it's been around for over 15 years. 
Ours opened in 2014 with about eight kids, and we are, our census now is pushing close to 30, and we have over 18 graduates from the high school. So we're excited to say that we have two graduates this year who have been accepted to the University of Texas and will be your colleagues next year. This is where it exists. That's University Christian Church. So when, I, when we first started the school, we weren't a University of Texas charter school. We were a private school when we first opened because we wanted to be able to create policies that work. So I got a call from UT Legal saying, stop showing that picture with the tower in it. Change your orange, it's too burnt. And stop saying you're on the campus, you're adjacent to campus. Look how close we are. <laughs> At this point, since we're a University of, Char University of Texas charter school, we can talk about being integral with the campus. We can have a little bit of burnt orange, and we can definitely say that we, we can show our pictures with the tower. <laughs> Um, so, we're UT Charter School, we have affiliation agreements with the Steve Hicks School of Social Work, Nursing, Marketing, Sango Learning Center, UGS, CSR. We have all of these departments working together, and the Drug and Alcohol Peer Advisors actually are the tutors at the high school as well. So we've got lots of interaction. The Center for Students in Recovery, which is recovering collegiate level recovering students, are mentors to the high school students. So that when the students are getting ready for college, they have already witnessed what it looks like for people to navigate what some people consider to be a sobriety hostile environment, a college campus. They know how to navigate it well because they've had good role models. And we do research at the high school with um, some established measures, some newer measures that are strength-based measures like recovery capital measures. We use the co contemplation ladder to look at changes in the stage of change, and we also look at the academic progress of our students. Here's a picture of our students from a recent event. Here's a picture of some of our graduates with the tower. Hallelujah. And that's our, that's our logo, so if you see that around, you'll know. If you walk past the University of Christian Church on the side there, you'll see the sign for University High School. We have sober tailgates. That is not an oxymoron. You can actually tailgate sober. We welcome you to come. It's usually on the grounds of the University uh, Christian Church. In a, this was about three years ago, the agency Facing Addiction created an event in DC on the uh, near the monument that drew over 30 million people in recovery. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. And, and advocates, not all those people were in recovery, but it was packed. And we took the, uh, the seniors from the high school there to represent. Oh, this is Julie. I'm going to introduce her. She can't be here tonight. They're having a family resource night at the high school. She's the executive director. This is Robin Payson. She's the executive director at Communities for Recovery. This is one of our past collegiate recovery program people. Uh, students who now runs a program out in Amarillo. This is Becky, who was the executive director at the time that we took the picture, and this is Valerie, she's the chair of the board at Communities for Recovery. That's Cheryl Pro, person in long-term recovery represents. Oh, and these are our students from the student council. <coughs> so here's the piece that I love to use my favorite metaphor in the world. Have you heard the story of the blind man and the elephant? So, if there are, you have heard this one, yes? So, if somebody's touching the tusk of the elephant, they're blind. They are going to say, this creature looks like a spear. And if they're touching the trunk, they're going to say, this creature looks like a snake. And if they're touching the leg, they might say, it's just like the trunk of a tree. If they're hanging onto the tail, they might say, it's a rope. If they're touching the side of it, they might say it's a wall. If they're touching the ear, they might say it's a fan. The point being, when we're all in our own disciplines, looking at just our little piece in the puzzle, and not having the conversations with others that are working in different aspects of that work, we're not likely to get the full picture. And even our publications are very often, because of the nature of academe, are written and published in our discipline journals. 
So, Nikki Marinelli, who's over here that works with the pharmacy and, and, and uh, the College of Natural Sciences, has a lab where she works with adolescent rats under the influence of substances. Yes, you can have addicted rats. She counts on that for her studies. And she studies social behaviors of her rats. I'm oversimplifying, so please ask her questions afterwards or get in touch with her if you're more interested. But my most exciting conversation that I ever witnessed, and it took 18 years at the University of Texas to hear it, is a conversation between Mickey Marinelli and Julie McElrath, who's the executive director at the high school, and they were talking about findings with Dr. Marinelli's rats that have implications for Julie's work with the kids at the high school. That's amazing for two researchers, even before they've read each other's work, know what each other are doing, they're having conversations about, gee, I wonder if this is something that you've tried. Those conversations are worth gold as far as I'm concerned. Because the way to come up with solutions is almost always interdisciplinary. So, this is the part where I throw out prizes. So what happened was, we had our own recovery orient. I'm just going to throw these out. Wait, let me get my students to throw these out. Will you guys come up here? Make sure you throw at least one to the front row, because... Thank you. Just, I want to see how good your arm is. You've got to get all the way in the back, get some in the middle, get some in the front. Okay, so I'm just going to talk while you throw these out. Most, almost all of these are recovery-oriented. Some of them are undergraduate studies t-shirts. So, and if they don't fit you, pass it on to somebody that will. Okay, ready? So the re recovery-oriented system of care is an agency that is, is a model that brings together all the folks that are working in that terms of house, big room. I'm not gonna try to talk to you guys. Did we do it? All right, good job. Let's give my students a hand. Yeah. So we have an agency called Recovery People that's Texas-wide, and they got a grant, and was it, were able to bring together a lot of the agencies in Austin and Central Texas area, some in Williamson County, who were coming to talk about ways to make a difference working together. These are just community agencies. And we started meeting regularly with the rule that to be a member of this group, you had to be action-oriented. We had to be creating things. So one year we did a recovery capital conference. Another year we start, started something, some of you got a t-shirt that says recovery in the park. It is a recovery event with all the agencies represented. So instead of competing against each other, and fighting for resources, they start collaborating and creating something bigger than any one agency could create. Yes? Whole is greater than the sum of the part. What's that called? Transit. Yeah? Oh, I should have asked you. Um, so, who's involved? Sage Recovery is a for-profit agency of therapists that work with young people in recovery. Oxford houses are re recovery houses that have no staff. They're just people in recovery living together. ERC is another. This is a rehab. We have Recovery ATX, which actually has a variety of services, but they, they even have a sober softball league, sober, sober volleyball. They also are the ones that now have taken on Recovery in the Park and are the primary agency that helps us make that happen every single year. It's up to over a thousand people showing up, which is really great. Communities for Recovery has recovery coaches. University of Texas Center for Students in Recovery, I've already talked about. University High School, we've already talked about. Teen and Family Services is something called an alternative peer group. My class knows what that is. That's uh, so that the students that go to the high school from eight to three have that wraparound service because they go there after school, they receive counseling there, their families recover, uh, recover together there, they have social activities, they have weekend activities, and one of them, Tia Family Services, even does a summer trip, uh, biking trip in Colorado, uh, mountain biking trip in Colorado. So it's all about having fun in recovery 
and being with other people in recovery. Because as I talked about, if they go, the, the research shows that somewhere between 70 and 90% of the kids that go off to treatment and return to their regular high schools relapse in the first several months. And that's sort of, as far as I'm concerned, that's the type of research like your shoe size increases with age up to a certain point. You know, that seemed very obvious to us. Um, but knowing that that is true is probably the most important piece of research that we had as a springboard for starting the recovery high school. So all of these agencies are working together. And then we decided that we would focus, those, some of those are adult agencies, and we needed to have a specific focus on the youth recovery. So we created the Youth and Emerging Adult Recovery Network. So at first, we spelled out the word yearn. Yes, Y-E-A-R-N is what we were calling the project. And then we decided that was a little long, so we shortened it to yearn, Y-R-N. But if you dictate the word yearn into your phone, what does it write? Yearn. Yes, indeed, it does. We were the Yearn Network, and that wasn't very good for us. So now we're calling it the Youth Recovery Network. I thought maybe we could get along, get away with calling it Your In. Right? Your In Network? No, it didn't work. We're changing the name. But the bottom line is we were funded through St. David's Foundation and Opportunity Grant. We have two years to figure out how we might work to. We got very excited because at one point we had a uh, Facing Addiction, who did that big concert in D.C., they came to us and said, we heard about a grant called the MacArthur 100 and Change. And that is a $100 million grant to solve a problem. We were just grandiose enough to think that we could get it. So we applied for that grant, and while we didn't win that grant, we were in the top 10%, which you know is a good thing, right? We were in the top 200 grants in the country. And so using that momentum, when the Vice President of Research announced that they were going to have the opportunity for pop-up institutes for interdisciplinary work around a particular problem, we were able to create the Youth Recovery Network as part of the UT Pop-Up Institute, bringing together all the projects that I've worked on. So I'm gonna run through these quickly. This website down here is our new website, so take note that if you enter, enter sites.utexas.edu backslash youth substance misuse, you'll be able to find the new website. Take a look at the directory. The interdisciplinary work that is happening from this pop-up institute is profound. So what, what are we doing? It's a diverse network of UT scholars, students, staff, and local agencies who focus on youth substance misuse, research, intervention, and recovery initiatives. As such, the group is positioned to make a substantial contribution to research and practice in multiple settings. The other thing that we're doing, so let me name the projects really quick so that you can become involved in them if you're interested. One is expanding the youth recovery network and looking at that as a springboard for actually redesigning healthcare systems around youth and substance use. So we're actually going to make, uh, uh, create digital platforms so that agencies can share information, have common assessments, refer to each other. It's, to me, it's like sci-fi. I'm so excited that that's uh, in the process. The other project, that we're doing is a wellness project through undergraduate studies where we're getting the experts together and, on, and they're doing research and they're gathering the research to make recommendations to undergraduate studies for ways to infuse undergraduate education, particularly signature courses, with wellness concepts and small shifts. There are other projects on campus doing that, so we're bringing them all together and we're working as a university with the wellness network the Center for Mental Health Counseling, I mean, some of the places that you might want to refer students if, you're, if, you, if they need help. There are mental health peer advisors. There's the interpersonal violence peer support networks. There's all kinds of silos again that we're finally bringing together by virtue of the pop-up institute. We do know that college-age students are 18 to 25 year olds are more likely than any other age group to have misused 
a prescription drug in the past year, to have used any illicit drug in the past month, and to have used heroin in the past month. This, I'm going to run through these real quick, but I want you to know that we have done some really profound and groundbreaking work by virtue of the death of five students due to overdose back in December of 2015. And that doesn't hit the news the way that a murder does, right? Families have shame about that. People don't want people to know. You need to know that, 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 that opioids can cause overdose and do cause overdose on college campuses. And so we started a project with this interdisciplinary team with the help of Chris Bronson, who's the Vice President of Student Affairs and the head of the Mental Health Center. We brought together folks from all of these UT entities and we created the Committee on Substance Safety and Overdose Prevention. If any of you are interested in this, we're having a meeting on Friday at 10 to 11 a.m. of this committee. You can come to the Center for Students in Recovery, which is in Belmont, room 222, and learn more about this. We recently did, recently did a drug take back, take back day. We have Operation Naloxone. You can go to operationnaloxone.org and get trained in how to administer naloxone. We have trained that provides resources for institutions, community organizations, healthcare providers. We've trained 250 plus resident advisors to identify and respond to opioid overdose and use naloxone by nasal spray. It's not even an injection now. This is at the information desk on every floor of every dorm and your RA knows where it is. We've trained the UT Police Department. Every officer on Chief Carter's staff knows how to recognize an overdose, do rescue breathing, administer naloxone if necessary. We will get anybody in this room naloxone if you know somebody that utilizes opioids and you're worried about them. Because the one thing about that is if you're in overdose, you cannot administer it to yourself. And here's the other thing that you need to know. Better you be wrong if you administer it and it's not opioids that they're overdosing on, it's like putting water into their system. Literally cannot. This is the pharmacy group that's been doing trainings with Operation Naloxone if you want to get involved with that. Um, we're having uh, some T-Tour folks get together and the DAPAs get together on at 11 to 12 o'clock on Friday at the Center for Students in Recovery. We have a student group right now in our classroom that's doing a project that was funded by NASPA to look at the issue of, I hate even calling them study drugs, they're amphetamines, the use of amphetamines for study. And what we know is 50% of UT students with ADHD medications get pressured to give or sell theirs. Um, so we're going to provide some support to those students and, and, and do some dissemination of the information. We also have a project. I have some colleagues in the audience that are uh, representing tonight from uh, a CARDIA grant that we have along with the Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. Uh, which is going to educate school nurses in elementary and middle schools because, believe it or not, our, in Texas, our 7 to 17 year old girls are at particularly high risk for opioids. We have a new healthy lifestyles living and learning community. This is a sober dorm that does, they have all kinds of mechanisms of wellness and recovery. I think that it is very, very important that you avail yourself of the Pop Up Institute that we have described, and so please go to the website. If you're interested in participating and learning from the interdisciplinary researchers or being involved in any of those projects, we are meeting on Friday at the Center for Students in Recovery at noon to 1.30. So here's two events that I want you to put on your calendar. We're having a national town hall around opioid prevention on May 14th. And the following day, we're having our pop-up summit all day long. And that will be open to you at Del Med. More information to come. Please email me if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts about people you care about that you don't know how to talk to, and especially contact me or somebody else that you've heard about in this presentation. 
if you yourself are concerned or curious about your own views. Any questions? Not that you want to ask in public. Please feel free to come up. I'll be here afterwards. Thanks for coming to me.